let's get started. Um, again, just putting things in, in perspective, uh, Professor Cohn talked about how in a big engineering design project you work through the various stages of, uh, and the first stage is phase A, uh, where you come up with the basic concepts. And, and I, I think the, the, the level of detail of the, of the system and subsystem lectures that, that he's giving last lecture and today, we could sort of look at as being on the kind of the phase A level to show the basic feasibility uh, and the overall structure. Um, those of you from Aero Astro uh, have certainly been familiar with our approach to uh, systems engineering, which we call CDIO. Uh, someone from Aero Astro can tell me the C is conceive, conceive design. design, implement, which actually means manufacture and test, and operate. Um, so we're, we're kind of dealing in these first few lectures, and this could be looked at as phase A, and then the, the, the design, the detailed design, that's your phase B. Uh, that ends with the, the uh, critical design review, after which, in principle, you're supposed to be ready to cut hardware. And then you get into the phase CD, where you actually build and test, and then, of course, we operate. Um, my sort of background the way I got into engineering, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning as sort of truth in advertising, is I was never trained as an engineer, unlike Professor Cohn. I was actually trained as an astrophysicist, but when I went to NASA, I spent so much time working with all the technical systems and interacting with the engineers and the people who use them um, that, that I learned uh, certainly a lot about the way these systems are designed and, and particularly operated. So my approach to uh, a lot of these engineering uh, situations is is very much from an operator's point of view and I'll try to emphasize that as we go along. It's very important right from the beginning of the design, I think, that you think about how you're going to operate the system. We, we have had too many examples that I've uh, come across and, and many people who, who have to actually operate systems where uh, you know you, you build something without really thinking of how the system is going to be maintained and taken care of. One of the things that, that we have been doing for the last few years is to take a group of undergraduates down to the Kennedy Space Center every January uh, interim activities period and have them spend a couple of weeks with the engineers and technicians who have to maintain and operate the shuttle system. And they hear lots of stories from, from these uh, the, the engineers and, and particularly from the technicians who say, boy, I'd like to have a chance to talk to the person who designed this little system. You know, I have to get my hand all the way around and it takes, you know, five hours to turn the bolt or, or something, uh, you know, more, more fundamental. And we, we'll probably discuss this when we talk about the main engines, the fact that you know, originally the main engines were, were supposed to be reusable without being taken out of the shuttle so that you could cycle them many times. Well, it turns out that in order to get sufficient uh, confidence that the engines are ready to fly, we really do have to take them out after every flight and they're extensively bore scoped and you look inside. But some of the, the uh, engineers in the main engine shop pointed out that, that for instance, if, if certain diagnostic uh, test equipment had been built into the engine so that you could have taken data as the engines were shutting down uh, over and above the data that, that we actually get, possibly we would have been able to uh, reduce considerably the maintenance on those engines. So again, this was the first, the shuttle was the first time we had really tried to design reusability into a space vehicle and engines, and we've learned an awful lot. So, so I think it's very important when we discuss the systems in the course of the, uh, uh, of, of the term that, that we don't just look at the detailed design, but we also consider the operations. That, that's, uh, that's very important. Okay, uh, so in, in, in that spirit, uh, Professor Cohn is going to continue his introduction to the, uh, the shuttle systems, and Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, um, as uh, 
Professor Hoffman said, I'm really giving you what I would call a, um, a technical management overview. Uh, because uh, when we talk about structures, uh, on the 22nd, uh, Mr. Moser is going to come and talk about structures and he's really going to go into the details. How the loads were calculated, how the stresses were calculated, how NASTRAN was used, how we came up with the with the basic, basic structure. But I'm just going to really give you a, a, a um, sort of a uh, overview on it. And I think it's interesting to note that the structures may be a very good a very good uh, system to look at for your project because it weighs a lot. We certainly didn't have all the all the tools that you have today, cal tools for calculations today, to make it a more efficient structure. Uh, the materials are a lot different, but basically this structure, if you start at the front of it, start at the front, the, the crew cabin, which I showed you a little bit about being made, it's a welded f configuration, and the forward fuselage are basically alumina an aluminum skin stringer sh structure. Very basic aluminum. Uh, if you go back down through the mid fuselage, which uh, is, the, is the large part there, the mid fuselage is a uh, is again a skin stringer. Interestingly enough, the uh, forward fuselage and the crew cabin were made by Rockwell International and Downey. The mid fuselage was made by General Dynamics in San Diego. So we had various people putting the, the structure parts together. The wings were made by Grumman. So uh, we had this this vehicle being built all over the country coming to Palmdale, California for assembly. Uh, and uh, so in the aft thrust structure was built by Rockwell. The vertical tail, I believe, was built by Fairchild on Long Island. Some of these places don't exist anymore. Uh, but then you go back to the, uh, the vertical tail. Again, it's uh, uh, aluminum uh, machine skins with honeycomb. Uh, the aft fuselage, as you can see, is very complicated. It's got the, all the plumbing, all the wiring, all the, high, the, uh, the auxiliary power unit. So it is a, a maze of plumbing and wiring. You can get lost in there and never find you again. But it is a maze of wiring and plumbing. And it's made basically of, uh, of um, uh, aluminum, but the, the, uh, a lot of the support structure are boron aluminum, uh, boron aluminum thrust structure panels with graphite epoxy, graphite epoxy skin panels. And then the payload bay doors, which was our innovative part, uh, innovative material going into uh, large uh, composites. We used graphite epoxy. That was the first time that uh, that uh, really a large composite structure was used in a vehicle. Now, now it's used quite commonly in the Air Force and a lot of places. But graphite epoxy was the uh, was the uh, was the panels we used, and that saved a lot of weight. One of the problems we had, uh, one of the problems we had though, is when we built these panels, we we found we got moisture trapped in it, and of course the moisture when you go and, and you heat it up. Uh, coming back, it could it would uh, pop the panels off. So we had to on the pad. We had to go in and drill little holes in these panels to be sure we could get the moisture to escape. Uh, so those are things you learn when you t do new technologies. But uh, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Moser is going to go through a very detailed explanation of this. This may be something you want to consider because there's there could be a real innovative way of uh, reducing the weight and making the vehicle more robust. So uh, I suggest uh, you think about that for uh, for the structure. Uh, now I'm going to go into uh, talk a little bit about guidance, navigation, and control. And some people asked me yesterday where they could find some information on it. And actually, in those orange or yellow books, I forgot what color they are, but that uh, we showed you, they're on hold in the library. Have a very detailed, a very detailed uh, analysis and discussion of how the guidance, navigation, and control system was formulated. And it's probably as good as you're going to find. It was very early in the program. It's different than it is, a little bit different than it is today. But it's a very good description of the of the uh, redundant uh, uh, computer set, the fail operational fail safe system. So I, I think. You could uh, really get a lot out of going through that book. Now, this chart. And I should just say, there's actually it turns out that we have two sets of those books in the library, and they're on reserve, so you know you can only use them for two hours at a time. So there really should not be any problem with everybody in the class having access to those books when you when you need to go and look at them. That will probably be the best uh, best source. Except when Phil Haddis from the Draper Labs comes and talks about the uh, the guidance system, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
this chart or this uh, schematic, whatever you want to call it, uh, was uh, originated uh, by the Johnson Space Center and Rockwell International. It took us many hours, but it, it basically is the uh, architecture. I'm going to go through with it, go through it in some detail for the guidance, navigation, and control system. Um, now, this was the original one. It's a little bit different today, and I'll explain the differences uh, that we have. But this was basically the guidance, navigation, and control system main architecture. And you can see on the left side. On the left side is what I would call sensors. And first, in a very simplistic term, some of you are experts in guidance, navigation, control. But guidance, navigation, and control, navigation is actually determining where you are. Guidance is getting to where you want to go. And control is controlling the vehicle and its stability and its, uh, its uh, characteristics around the center of gravity. So that's basically control. So this is the, for the total guidance, navigation, control system. Interestingly enough, uh, the contractor for this was uh, IBM Federal Systems Division. We used their computer and they did the software. Uh, much of the hardware built, was, was uh, designed and built by other contractors and Rockwell, Rockwell International uh, basically did the integration. And they did the integration on a, on a uh, system called the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory. It was basically a vehicle that was in the laboratory that have all, had all the electronics, the cockpit, and everything in it. It simulated the actuators. The hydraulic system was simulated, and the engines were simulated. But basically, all the hardware and software was in the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory. I imagine you spent some time. Uh, we actually had two. We had one in Houston, and there was one out at Rockwell. And and when Professor Cohn says that it was a it was a, a vehicle, you, you you have to appreciate it. It was actually laid out just like the shuttle, so that they they had the controllers which were in the aft end, like in the engine compartment, were you know 100 feet away from the uh, the crew Say cabin and the computers, and all the the lines, the the data and and power lines, were laid out as closely as possible to physically duplicate the layout in the shuttle, because there was there was concerning about the timing of signals going back and forth, and and they wanted to to run the simulation as accurately as possible um, they had and, and then of course you have to have a set of simulation computers to try to determine the environment that the shuttle would be f uh, flying in and and so that it could make the inputs to the the rate gyros and the the other parts of the the measurement units to try to duplicate the flight regime uh, to, uh, and here's a here's a explanation of the uh, alphabet soup that of all the uh, systems, subsystem components. But let, let, on this side, you see really the sensors. That's the information that you need to do your navigation, uh, your navigation part of it. And then, of course, that information then is sent to the computer through a multiplexer, demultiplexer, an AMDM, which basically is a digital, is an analog to digital converter, a digital to analog converter. The computer does its uh, computations and then sends it to the effectors, which actually change uh, whether it's the RCA reaction control system, whether it's the orbital maneuvering system, whether it's the aero surfaces, the SRV actuators, the solid rocket booster actuators, the manned propulsion system actuators. So that's really how you, so you get sensors, computation, and effectors. Let me talk a little bit about one sensor, which probably is, uh, many of you can relate to, and that's the IMU, or the Inertial Measurement Unit. Uh, the inertial me and, uh, Draper Labs is famous for its inertial measurement units. I worked with Draper Labs or MIT Instrumentation Lab on Apollo, and we had the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, original inertial measurement unit developed by the uh, by the MIT Instrumentation Lab in that vehicle. Um, the inertial measurement unit is, it has gyros on it to determine angles, and it has accelerometers on it. And it is aligned with the star tracker. It's, it's a basically sta uh, uh, stable platform. It's aligned with the star, star tracker to get a reference system in inertial space. And when you make a maneuver, you get acceleration and you send it to the computer and you integrate it once, you get uh, velocity, you integrate it twice, you get position. And uh, it's also used during powered flight and it's used during entry. But that then goes to the computer. So the inertial measurement unit is very critical. Just to give you an example, 
So here you have three of them. These show you have three of them. And you got four computers. I'm going to talk about the computers in a minute. You have three of them. You had to recognize when we went to the moon on Apollo, we had one IMU and one computer uh, in the command and service module. And we had one IMU and one computer in the lunar module, except we did have a backup system called the strap, a strap down system. We did have uh, that was one was built by um, primary system was Draper Labs, MIT, and the backup system was TRW. So we had two different contractors. Uh, and then you have rate gyros and accelerometer assemblies, primarily for the for ascent, for the stability of the uh, bending of the uh, vehicle. Here's the air data transducers that we talked about yesterday for our entry. Then you have the microwave landing system, the tactical, tactical navigation, radar altimeter, rendezvous radar. These are all sensors you use during various phases of the mission, which again go through the MDMs or multiplexer demultiplexers to the computers, and then to the uh, effectors, which make which change your position and change your position or, or and uh, uh, velocity as need be. Let me talk about the computers for a moment. You see four computers. That was the real test of this system. We had four computers that were synchronized. This vehicle, as we talked about yesterday, we decided to make it for your for your aerodynamicist. We decided decided to make it uh, uh, statically unstable. We saved a lot of weight. By that I mean a regular airplane, a normal airplane that's stable. When you get a, a disturbance, it'll come back. It'll still come back to it without any without any augmentation. It'll come back to its original position. With this vehicle, if you get a disturbance, it'll diverge. So you had to continually have, augment, have augmentation. So you had to have a fail operational, fail safe system. And that's why you have four computers. It's fail operational, fail safe. You can lose one computer and you're fail operational, you use another computer. That means you got two, two left and you're fail safe and you come home. So, uh, so that's what it is. Now, the real concern about it is these computers are synchronized. They essentially communicate with each other 440 times a second. Uh, now I'm recalling a lot of this from memory, but uh, 440 times per second, and they actually vote on each other uh, to a, simple, a simplistic form of ter uh, terminology. And if one computer is out, it, it votes it out, another computer takes over. Basically, that's that's. It. But the concern we had, the concern we had was that in doing this, we could have a generic failure and lose all computers, or we could have what we call a two-on-two two two split. And these would be sort of diabolical errors which would cause the vehicle to fail. So we decided, after this was made, to put, up a put in a backup flight system, a backup computer, a fifth computer. Now it turns out there was an argument there. Should we have the fifth computer, a different computer, and different people, or should we have the same computer with different people? And we argued long and hard on how to do it. And we, and we had a lot of experience with the Draper Labs. The Draper Labs just did, did an outstanding job, or the MIT Instrumentation Lab just did an out, outstanding job on the Apollo vehicle, both on the command and service module and the lunar module. So we went to the MIT Instrumentation Lab, Draper Labs, I, and asked them to actually take the same computer that's, that's it, but put it outside the loop. It's not part of the, of the redundant set. It's outside the loop. It gets all the, I didn't show the schematic right, because it gets all the same information that the other computers get. But it then can take over if the primary system fails. Now Phil Haddis did this work for the, uh, for, for the Draper Labs for NASA in this backup system. He's going to talk, he's going to give you a lecture. So he, he's very good to lecture on this total system. He can tell you about the total system. But we thought we'd put the backup flight system in just for a short period of time to give us confidence on the primary system. But it turns out that we put, started putting things in it that now we need it. We need it so we could not take it out. So it's really part of a major system. So that is uh, a very different part of the system today. Uh, I don't think we ever really had a, a diabolical problem in flight. I think we did have one in, in the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory one time when we had a two-on-two -two split. But when we did the approach and landing test, uh, where we had the arbiter on top of the 747, and we separated the arbiter and landed, I remember that first flight, I was sitting in the control station at, at Edwards Air Force Base, and at that time I smoked a pipe, and uh, when we separated, 
a big X came across the screen because we lost the first computer. But, uh, I guess the shock actually broke a, a solder joint in the computer. The, the power shock, power technic shock from separating actually broke the first computer, so we had to go to the second computer. I bit my pipe in two, but it did prove that the redundant set did work because it took over and landed well. So we had to have a very, we had a very successful in-flight test, uh, not planned, but it turned out to be a very, uh, very successful in-flight test. Now, this, uh, so. Um, when you make the computations, you get the information on position uh, that the computer com computes. It sends it to the to the uh, effectors. The effectors may be uh, during uh, entry, high, uh, uh, during uh, entry during the high part of entry. May be to the reaction control system, the forward RCS system, or to the aft, uh, or it could be to the ohms system if you're trying to uh, make a maneuver. Or when you get down lower in the surface, or lower in the atmosphere, it could be the aero surface actuators. And then during ascent, it's to the TVC uh, for the solar rocket boosters or the main propulsion system. So those are the effectors. The flight control system is a very interesting system because for entry, because as you can envision, early in the flight, early in the entry, you don't have any aerodynamics, so your aero surfaces aren't of any value to you, and you use the reaction control system. But as you get farther into the atmosphere, the loads become so high that the reaction control system becomes ineffective, and then you have to use the aero surfaces. So it's a blended system, and the system has to it, the system has no wind to handle the aero surfaces versus the reaction control system. And of course, then you also have displays to the crew, crew, and actually uh, information that the crew can use to make certain decisions. So that basically is the the guidance and navigation and control system. There's one additional change that I don't have on this chart, is that they have incorporated the global positioning system uh, in the in the shuttle. Uh, the GPS is now part of the uh, system. Uh, it took a long time to do it because I remember it was it wasn't done when I left, and I guess you said it was. Was it? Were you still there when it was implemented? Yeah, they started. To, they they yeah. did put it in. And on GPS, you can essentially get position. Uh, if you could get attitude, if you could get attitude, then theoretically you could eliminate the inertial measurement unit. So, um, and I think they, I don't think they do it that way. But it, theoretically, the GPS for you looking at the guidance system change, you ought to. This is, again becomes a very interesting uh, system to look at. Would you do it different today? Would you do it? For example, this, these computers. This uh, this is the, the computer was used. Is a uh, I don't, can't remember all the. the uh, characteristics, of, but it's basically the IBM Four Pi computer, which is a very old computer. Uh, it's probably made before many of you were were <laughs> using computers. But huh? <laughs> it was an old AP 101, which I think was a, a design from the early 70s. Yeah, it is the early 70s. Yeah. yeah. So this is this would be a very neat system to take a look at for your system. And not only that, you probably could get a lot of support from Draper Labs and that type of thing. So it'd really be a good system to take a look at. And I'm sure you can make a lot of improvements. Those improvements could theoretically be used on the, the uh, on the new CEV, the crew exploration vehicle. So I think it would land a lot of merit to you, uh, you very smart people, to take a look at the the guidance, navigation, and control system. Yes, sir. In the air data transducers, was there more than just pitot tubes and static ports? Or that's all it was, I believe. I think that's I think that's right. was. Yeah, we had a lot of problems with those. I think it's just very it's very old technology. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. How did yes. you get positioned? Uh, you got told a lot of time, sir. I was going to ask how you, how you got positioned information for um, GPS. Uh, position? Yeah. Uh, well, it's. Uh, don't know exactly, but it's got what thirteen uh, uh, satellites going around. Yeah. Can you? Well, there, there, there's two ways. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the, the desire for GPS, of course, was to give the shuttle autonomous navigation capability. The shuttle, with the with the star trackers and the IMUs, it has the autonomous ability to determine its attitude, but it doesn't know where it is because the inertial measurement units drift over time, and so you need to be able to update, update it, it, the state. It, it, Vectors. Uh, originally, this was done by just the only way you could do was radar tracking from the ground. You would track it, 
you'd get right. a state vector, you'd uplink the state vector, and then the shuttle would know where it was, and then peri periodically have to update it because of IMU drift. Once we got the uh, tracking and data relay satellite system installed, uh, you do have a certain cap you you do get navigational information by the Doppler uh, Doppler navigation right. from the signals coming back and forth through Tedris, but it was generally calculated on the ground. So it was not really until the advent of GPS that um, that we got autonomous capability. Um, you need it for things like, I mean, if you're going to deploy a satellite, for instance, uh, you, you need to know your position pretty accurately um, because the satellite is going to take that position and has to do its burn accordingly. And obviously for, uh, for re your re-entry burn or for rendezvous, it's critical that, that you know your position. Um, when you're doing a rendezvous, the shuttle does have a rendezvous radar. Yeah. I don't know if we'll deal with that in detail. So, so once you get close enough to the object that you're rendezvousing with, such that you can get it either with your radar or they actually use the star trackers to optically track the object, then you can start getting your relative position with respect to the object, even though you may not know your absolute position. And so to that, from that point of view, the shuttle gets a certain degree of autonomy. Maybe I'll just say one other sure, thing about sure. the, the computers because, I mean, it, people are amazed at, at how primitive the shuttle computers are. That's right. But, like I say, they, the original idea and the concepts that we talked about, this was going to be, you know, an airplane-like vehicle and originally they wanted to use some off-the-shelf hardware and, right. of course, the AP-101s as they finally used them were not off-the-shelf. But, uh, you know, the ori these original computers had 128K of memory. Uh, yeah. And the memory they used, probably, I don't know if any of you <laughs> have, have read back in the history of computing where they actually had the little magnetic ring cores with the wires going yeah. through. I mean, it, this, this was really old stuff. And they did finally replace that with a solid state memory with a whopping 256K. Um, and again, probably none of you have, have dealt with overlay technology, but back when I was a graduate student and we were we were using computers to do complex astrophysical calculations, sometimes you would have a program that was too big for the computer memory. So you'd have the whole program on a tape recorder and, and you'd right. segment it mass, into what they would memory. call overlays, and then you would load it one part at a time and it would do its calculations, and then you would stop and load the next batch of software Software. Well, that's the way we have to run a mission. The, the computers cannot hold enough software to do ascent, orbit, and entry. There's three segments of flight software. You start the mission with the ascent software loaded. Then when you get up into orbit, you do what they call a major mode transition where you basically, you know, you, you punch a button and everything goes blank and you sort of sit there saying, hmm, hope this is going to load properly and the, the tape recorder chunks yeah, away nice and, yeah. and, uh, and, and then it loads the orbiter part, uh, the orbit part and the same thing when you're getting ready for entry. Now the backup system, they decided that they didn't want to take that risk, that if something went major wrong in a major way, they wanted the whole flight software on the backup system and that meant it had to be scrubbed so the backup system is capable of flying the shuttle and getting it home safely but there are a lot of capabilities which the main computer system can do uh, which the backup system can't do just because they're limited to the amount of software um, the one other thing I'll say is you know Putting together this uh, redundant set of four computers, because as Professor Cohn said, the shuttle will not fly without the computers. So I mean, it is absolutely flight critical. So, you know, hundreds of times a second, every computer is looking at the data from all the other computers, and they're all voting. And so you have this this matrix just to, to make sure you understand the way the system works. If if computer number one sees a problem with computer number three, 
it's likely that computer three is also going to see a problem with computer one because they're they're they they're doing something different. But if computer number two sees a problem with computer three, and computer three sees a problem with computer two, and computer four sees a problem with computer three, now you've got a three to one vote, and so computer three will recognize that it is the problem and it will take itself out of the set and that's what happened with the well in that case the computer actually shut yes, down I, I remember the, the that big X and <laughs> I, bit, uh, I bit my pipe into and uh, and at the same time all of this information has to go back and forth to the backup computer because if you're ever going to engage the backup it's, it's computer, be ready to go. it has to be ready to go at a split seconds notice and you know the big question is suppose you get there are situations where you can get a two-on-two -two split uh, and you know when we run through the uh, the simulations to learn how to work this uh, actually learning the ins and outs of how to how to work the computer system is is probably one of the biggest uh, they become, training the astronauts become more knowledgeable than the designers yeah. they, they actually in the, in <laughs> that's the their lifeblood that, yeah if there's this Danger of a two of a two to two vote. Was it ever thought about to have five computers? That well, that's why we put the backup system in. Yeah. So oh, it was the backup. Yeah, the backup system. That's that was really why we put the backup system in, uh, by, because it uh, it did a little bit more too. It, uh, it it was programmed by different people, even though it used the same computer. The, it was actually programmed and formulated by different people. So that was one way of, of uh, saying take away any, uh, you might say, systematic errors that were in the redundant set. In other words, they kept the same software requirements yes. document, but it was the actual coding was done by, by Draper rather than by IBM. Because that was the other problem. You know, suppose all the four computers are doing the same thing, but but there was an error in the well, code which never turned out. So that so that something starts to diverge, and and you know what what's your protection against that. There's a big argument in, in uh, doing that. Uh, the real argument says, should you really have this a different computer? Should you really just say, just do everything differently? Just have a, a different computer, different everything? And of course, there's advantages to that and there's disadvantages to that. So uh, we, we settled on this as something to do. I think, I think there was another question. Was there a question back there? Yes. Yeah. I, think there, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, um, you said this was the first fly-by wire system. I was wondering what competing ideas there were besides having a computer system. Well, with a fly-by-wire means that you, when you put an input into the control system, uh, whether you do it manually or whether the computer does does it, nevertheless, it's ultimately your your command just goes into the computer. You know, you you put the stick to the to the left, saying I want to do a, a left bank. Um, all you're doing is telling the computer you want to do a left bank and now the computer has to figure out what's my navigation state where am I if I'm coming down through the atmosphere what's my altitude what's the what's the air pressure what's my Mach number what and then it's programmed with uh, aerodynamic control laws this is one of the big challenges because as I mentioned the other day you hit the top of the atmosphere at Mach 25 uh, you do your initial control with the RCS as you get as the dynamic pressure starts to increase you, uh, you know first the the uh, the ailerons the the roll becomes active at about uh, I think 10 pounds per square inch something like that is the you 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 blend the roll control into your aero surfaces at about 20 uh, I think it's pounds per square inch you can do the pitch control but because the, the the shuttle is coming in at a 40 degree angle, the, the the vertical stabilizer is pretty much shadowed. So, um, so for for yaw control, you actually have to keep using the RCS all the way down to about Mach one when the shuttle finally pitches down and the and the vertical stabilizer now now has some effectivity. The computer calculates all that this information and it comes to use the effectors. It comes to the, the effectors and that's what you do the control laws on that. And the problem is that the the flight control laws which the computer has to use in order to control the, the air surfaces in the RCS 
are not constant on your way down. I mean, the flight control laws at Mach 15 are very different from at Mach 5. Um, and there, there's a part of the flight regime, for instance, where if you want to do a, a left bank, you actually have to start by commanding a right yaw and, and then the aerodynamic uh, the, the cross-coupling terms in the aerodynamics actually causes you to go in the other direction. It gets very complex and the, the flight control system is continually changing as, as the entry progresses. Um, and so the idea that you know maybe you should have a direct backup link between the pilot's inputs and the aero control surfaces although you know it might give you a warm fuzzy feeling you could not fly the shuttle directly because to to be able to to take into account these changing control laws on the way down you just can't do it in fact the the shuttle is uniquely i mean unless the shuttle knows where it is if the navigation state goes bad the shuttle cannot fly you you could you could have the runway in sight but if the shuttle's inertial nav state is wrong, you'll lose control and you can't land. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex system but, from know, that this, point of view. This is, a, this is a very, very, if you can envision the systems engineering that went into this, that went into this system, it takes aerodynamics, it takes uh, flight dynamics, it takes uh, electrical signals, it takes uh, guidance laws, navigation laws, hardware, software. Uh, this is probably the biggest integration job that our systems engineering job that you have on the it, it requires everything. It also has to take into consider aerodynamic heating. I'm going to show you that in a minute because you got to be sure that you don't fly outside the regime that you were designed for aerodynamically. I think you had a question. Yeah, uh, just real quick, how big are those IMUs? Because um, you know nowadays you can get yeah, a the, the, the one. Well, um, I, you know I don't recall. I do know it, it's a box. It's yeah, about like a shoe box. The, the Apollo IMU was about this big. That was uh, built for the Polaris vehicle. It was it was one IMU. It was a three gimbal platform. And I remember uh, it was a big issue by a three gimbal platform, you know, has a sing singularity. So you had to maneuver the Apollo vehicle a certain way so you didn't get the singularity in it. And one of our astronauts, Jim McDivitt, who's a quite a famous astronaut, who's a good friend of mine, said he wanted a fourth gimbal. And there was no way we could get an IMU in that day and time with the fourth gimbal. So what I did is I built, I gave him a fourth gimbal to carry with him on his flight, a little gimbal system to get a fourth gimbal. But uh, yeah, we didn't have the gimbal lock problem on the shuttle. No, the gimbal you didn't know because it's four, it's four gimbal platform. But uh, I remember we went through that with MIT Transportation Lab many times because all you could get at that time, because the IMUs were so big, a fourth gimbal was almost impossible. And McDivitt was a was a was a very good astronaut, but he wanted four gimbals. In fact, he wound up being my boss. So before we go on, let me, let me just um, <laughs> mention one. Sure. One, go ahead. Uh, um, more thing about the backup system. Uh, the backup system actually takes a lot of care and maintenance and there's a lot of money that goes that's into right, that. Right. And and this is not a, a dead issue because in the design of the CEV, NASA is going to have to make a decision. Uh, there there were some guidelines which were produced a couple of years ago out, uh, out of the Johnson Space Center with a lot of astronaut office uh, input about what are the requirements in the future for human space vehicles. Uh, and they put in that, that you should have a backup computer system because, you know, basically that's the way we did the shuttle and, and that was an I, I, actually that was, was an afterthought yeah and yeah. and and yet now now it's being listed as a requirement and and this is now being questioned for the yeah. CEV because it's a it's a huge uh, financial in uh, impact and so we're we, you know we're gonna have to deal with these problems all over again so it so it's an interesting thing to think about if some of you want to delve a little bit more deeply I think this could lead itself to a lead to a very interesting activity for you yes sir I just didn't show this very accurately because I, I looked at the chart when I had it and I said, my God, this is the wrong chart. But this was the chart, uh, this was the original chart before the backup system. So I quickly penciled in the backup system so I remember to talk about it. But no, it has the same sensors. It, it has all the same information. But again, most of those sensors are redundant. Yeah, the redundant sensors. Not, yeah. not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. Any one of the four computers can be any of these sensors. It's not like the sensor one is dedicated. That's right. That's they're, they're put on, the sensor input is put on a data bus and they have multiple data buses, like four data buses, and each of the computers can read all four 
four data buses. I mean, there's there's a, just a tremendous amount of redundancy built in. Yes, go ahead. Did they ever use the Star Tracker to update your gyros? It's like uh, the platform. Yeah, they do that. Yes. There's also a. Yeah. Uh, a Procedure. If you totally lose attitude, then you have to go right back and 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 manually take a star sight <clears throat> and orient and, and that we've only had to do in the simulator. Uh, never had to do that. You know, to look at the failure history of this would be very interesting. It, it's been. I think I know we lost in my tenure. I know we lost uh, one inertial measurement unit. We lost that one computer during the approach and landing test. I don't know what other uh, failures we actually had in this system. I don't know if we ever lost any. The MDMs, this box was made by Sperry at the time in, in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And I've visited that many times because that is probably the most compl complicated electronics box of this whole system other than the computer. It's very, very complicated. Yes, sir. Oh, computers have developed a lot faster than, um, than paranoids. So why do you think? Why do you still think that it'll be a major expense now? I, I don't think it'll be a major expense now. I think, as I recall. And uh, this, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, NASA does not put a lot of money into development of this technology because other people have done it. It's it's pretty much so much more sophisticated than we have now. Don't need it. Uh, it turns out, though, at one point in time, structures was the most important, uh, most expensive component of a spacecraft. Then, of course, there was propulsion, and then there became avionics and software. And avionics and software for the shuttle is very, very expensive. It's probably one of the most expensive things. I think today, in today's environment, with the technology we have with the, uh, te uh, in both software and hardware, I think it won't be that expensive anymore. So I think you're right. I think you're, you're, it's very good. That's why I'm saying, in redoing it, you could use new technology and really show how much how much less it's going to weigh because the IMUs are probably going to be smaller. Uh, you could reduce the weight, you could reduce the electric power, and you could reduce the uh, the cost. But you're going to have another detailed briefing on this, and I, I think uh, it's uh, Phil Haddis. I know him very well, and I think he'll do an outstanding job in uh, in explaining to you what's happened. Let me just show you briefly, very briefly. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, but here are some of the things that uh, are profiles that the guidance system has to be has to be able to do. It certainly has to take care of launch. Uh, it certainly the other the abort modes, which are interesting. There is a abort mode that's a return to launch site. And I guess you would use return to launch site primarily for a main engine failure, I guess. That's, so if the main engine fails uh, during ascent, you can go to a return to launch site. Or a total loss of cabin pressure. Is it? Yeah, something like that. And I guess that's never been tried. And I guess that's probably one of the most difficult maneuvers, most, most biggest fears the astronauts have if they ever have to come back to return to launch site. But of course, the guidance system's got to be capable to take care of that. Then you have uh, um, Abort, uh, abort once around. Again, uh, when you have main engine cut off, you have separation, and you abort to once around. Again, I guess that's primarily a main engine problem. And then you have, of course, an abort to orbit. And those are the three abort regimes you have. Yes, sir. Transatlantic. Transatlantic. Yes, you have transatlantic abort. That's right, you do have a transatlantic abort. Yes, thank you. It actually drives the, uh, the launch window. Excuse me? That actually drives the launch window. Yeah, yeah. right. But they don't have clear weather overseas. Right, or wrong that's or right. Like that. They don't launch. Right. Right. So the guidance system has to have take care of all those abort modes. Again, I'm sure Phil will go through this with you, but first stage guidance is really consists of uh, attitude and throttle schedule is a function of relative velocity. So it's not completely open loop, but it's almost an open loop system, but you do control the thr thrust vectors of the of the engine and the solid rocket booster actuators. And it's the key thing though, where, where system engineering comes to play, it has to uh, uh, take, it's got to get, get maximum performance, but it's got to be shaped, uh, the angle tack history has to be shaped to control aerodynamic loads. Because some of the highest loads you have, and you'll find out when uh, Mosher talks about it, some of the highest loads you have on the structure is during ascent. Co control of maximum dynamic pressure, and you have to provide the flight angle at SRB staging to allow recovery of the spent boosters. So see, these are some of the constraints that you have. And again, this comes out to be a real systems engineering problem. And for entry, entry really becomes a, 
uh, that really becomes a task in itself because the basic pro one of the basic problems you have to control is thermal control. The uh, thermal protection system. Uh, I should have pointed out on that, uh, that structural slide that the back face temperature uh, of the tiles have to be at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the surface temperature may be 15 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The back face has to be at two, 350 degrees Fahrenheit because that's the limit of aluminum. So you've got to control the guidance, the thermal control for guidance uh, is to keep the vehicle within the temperature constraints of the peak heating region. So that's all got to be married together so that the tile system you design keeps the back face temperature to within 350 degrees on the aluminum structure. Uh, then you go into equilibrium glide, the constant bank angle that we were talking about is modulated for drag control, and then the transition guides the vehicle from the high O braking to the lower angle of attack, and then you basically land. So all this has to be tied together for your guidance, navigation, and control system. I have one more uh, system that I'd like to talk about briefly that gives you, you know, you're going to have another t uh, very detailed briefing on this. This is the hydraulic system. Uh, this ties in together with the, uh, the other systems we talked about. The, uh, the, uh, the flight control system, the guidance system, part of the flight control, because the hydraulic system is a 3,000, it's three systems, it's 3,000 pounds per square inch system. It's, uh, and it, what does it do? It, it basically is used during ascent and entry for to control the uh, thrust vector control of the engines, for the body flap, for the elevons, for the rudder speed brake, the main engine. Uh, 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 actuators for the main engine, uh, when you, the doors for the external tank separation, main landing gear, nose, uh, nose wheel steering, and so forth and so braking. So that's what the hydraulic system does. It's a very, if you lose your hydraulic system, you had a bad day. And there are three systems. I do believe there are, is one place where there's a single point failure in the, in the hydraulic system. It's pretty hard to eliminate all single point failures. I believe that. When Henry Pohl talks, he's going to be doing that. Very detailed discussion on the hydraulic system. You might ask him that. I don't recall, but he'll, he'll tell you whether there is a, uh, a single point failure in the hydraulic system. And this, uh, the hydraulic system, this is a schematic of it. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of it because I'm not sure I can explain it. But basically, it, it, uh, this is the hydraulic system that shows it's how system one, system two, system three is tied in to the, uh, the right outboard elevon, the right inboard elevon, and so forth and so on. The uh, main engines, uh, the external tank, and uh, we've never had a loss in the hydraulic system. We did have, we did test the hydraulic system in what we call the Flight Control Hydraulics Laboratory at Downey, where we had actually all the hydraulic systems tied together with the uh, uh, computer system and actually flew the vehicle, what we call this Iron Bird, where we actually had a hydraulic system. And uh, we did have a failure there at one time early in the program. We had a failure where we ruptured, uh, we had a single point failure, we lost all the hydraulic fluid. We had to go back and make a major, major change to the, uh, the actuator system, the hydraulic system. Um, one other, yes sir? I'm just wondering how the hydraulic system on the shuttle compares to the hydraulic system on an aircraft. Yeah. You know, I think, I'm really not sure I can explain it because I'm not, I think there's not much difference. The only difference, let me, let me, let me tell you, the, let, me, let me tell you the only difference, I think, uh, I think the airplanes, and somebody's here more an expert than I am, I think airplanes have three hydraulic systems. The shuttle started out with four hydraulic systems. We actually started out with four, but it was so heavy and so complicated, we decided to go to three. And I think uh, we did, I think the airplanes have three hydraulic systems, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, does anybody know? I'm not. Uh, I, I at least know quite a few that, uh, that have three. three. I don't know if all airplanes have three. The, the big difference in it is that the hydraulic system in the, in the shuttle is powered by what we call an auxiliary power unit. And this show, and that, that's what pressurizes the system. The, and I think on, a, uh, on an airplane, it's powered by the, uh, by the turbines of the engine, the engine itself. But this system is pressurized by what we call a auxiliary power unit. A auxiliary power unit is a box about this big. It generates 135 horsepower, and it's got a 10-inch 
turbine wheel and it goes about uh, uh, 10 to 20,000 RPM and actually it, it's fu fueled by hydrazine and it essentially pressurizes the uh, the um, system to get you up to 3,000 psi. Again, if this turbine, if this auxiliary power unit doesn't work, we have three of them. If this auxiliary power unit doesn't work, it's a bad day. And I think we did have some problems with one of the auxiliary power units one time during ascent. But uh, that's the major difference, I think, because I think we tried to copy pretty much aircraft designs using the same type of hydraulic fluid and everything else. So I think we copied their standard in, in using, as I recall, except we're, we're pressurized by the auxiliary power unit. Again, to not to belabor the point, you're going to have a very detailed briefing uh, or lecture on the hydraulic system, the auxiliary power unit, and the reaction control system, the ohm system, by Henry Pohl. So you'll have more details on this. Again, the hydraulic system might be another interesting thing to take a look at, but I hope what I'm trying to get across to you is how these systems all fit together. You can't do the guidance, navigation, and control without the hydraulic system. You, got, you have the aerodynamics, and you have the aerothermodynamics, you got the structures, you got everything that has to fit together. And you can imagine the systems engineering problem associated with trying to put all that together. Just to, uh, to remind you a few that the, the other things that you have to deal with, if you're going to that, excuse, that excuse, on. Excuse me. Um, when, when you're working uh, with a space system that, that also makes it a little bit different from uh, designing for the ground. For instance, you have a fuel tank with the, uh, the hydrazine, uh, or hydrazine in it. Um, you know, this, this is a, a generic problem with, with any liquid tanks. Uh, once you're in weightlessness, how do you get the, the liquid to flow out? Um, this is actually a fairly um, traditional, old-fashioned design where they have a, a, a diaphragm in the tank and on one side of the diaphragm you pressurize it with either helium or nitrogen and that pushes the material, uh, it, you know, it's basically sort of like squeezing it out of a bag. Um, the problem is that hydrazine is, is nasty stuff and uh, in, the, uh, in the orbital maneuvering and reaction control systems they decided that for reusability they didn't want to use diaphragms and so uh, we'll probably learn more about some of the details but there's a very elaborate screen mechanism which uses surface tension to collect the material and and just getting getting liquids out of a tank into where you want to go is, is something you have to worry about in space the second problem is uh, is a thermal problem you know you don't have you're not flying through the atmosphere so you don't have air cooling so you know as you see you've got the gearbox you're generating a lot of heat uh, and you actually in order to cool they, they use water spray boilers so you you essentially and, and we actually do this to get rid of, of heat from the orbiter as well before we open the radiator the payload bay doors which have radiators while those are closed it has to be done with a water spray boiler and so you get rid of all your heat uh, by putting it into a, a heat exchanger and you basically shoot liquid water and of course in a vacuum the water flash evaporates and that takes the heat away so there are although the you know in essence the control system is similar to airplanes there's even there there's a lot of special um, design features that have to be put in because this is a system that has to work in space as well that's a very good point that the, heat, the cooling is one of the biggest uh, differences uh, uh, because this system is so complex and heavy uh, and and needs a lot of maintenance uh, and uses is hydrazine, which which you know is very nasty stuff. Uh, there have on at various occasions been uh, studies of could this system be replaced by an electromechanical system? And as as motors become more powerful and battery and, and fuel cell systems have, are more efficient, uh, I think just about two years ago we gave up on the last but, effort. Uh, but it, I think it always end, turned out to be too heavy. Too, too heavy. The, the, to, to get an electro mechanical system which had enough muscle to, to move these air surfaces around, uh, it just is, is beyond what we could But that do. might be another good system to take yeah. a look at today. It might be another good system. The other thing is this does have a, uh, you see where it has a speed control and safety for the APU controller. Uh, the interesting thing about this, uh, this turbine wheel, I, I forget the exact uh, uh, RPM, but it's pretty high. I think it's at least 10 to 20,000 RPM. If this should break off, if this shaft should break, 
and that uh, it, there's very difficult. It's very difficult time, a very hard time to control it in the uh, box. I mean, it'll go right through the box it's in and share the vehicle. So uh, we, we've tried everything we know. We put protect protection around it. We put a lot of margin into the turbine wheel, into the shaft. But that's a very critical thing. And as uh, Professor Hoffman mentioned, there's been many exercises to replace the auxiliary power unit. And I think again, this would be another good challenge to take a look at seeing what you could do to come up with a, a different design for the auxiliary power unit. But there'll be other systems that you might want to look at. But I thought I'd just give you a little discussion of some that I think, I personally think, are very pertinent that uh, look at. That's what the thermal protection system, the structures, the guidance navigation and control, uh, the hydraulic system, including the APU. And these, I think, would be very good systems. Now, you might pick others, but these might be very good ones to look at. Let me wind up my, my discussion by talking to you what um, I think you ought to look for. In, in the systems. This is a, just a very simplistic chart, but this is my way of thinking about what you do when you go about designing something. You need to look at the functions. As we pointed out yesterday, uh, the functions are very important because when we talked about thermal protection system, we looked at the functions of protecting the vehicle, maintaining that back surface temperature to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. We worked that to, to the finite detail. We knew exactly how thick the tiles had to be, what the characteristics had to be, but what did we do? We forgot, oddly enough, that it had to be attached to the vehicles, sadly, which is sort of dumb, and you would think, my gosh, they ought to be able to do that, but uh, you're infinitely smarter after you find out your problem. So one thing you ought to do is really understand what functions have to be performed, and you might say that becomes your functional uh, requirements. The whole thing is understanding your requirements. Then you ought to understand what, perf what performance is required. In other words, performance requirements. You ought to have a first order of magnitude calculations of what kind of performance requirements you need. A lot of times this is going to have to come from assumptions, uh, talking to people, getting experts involved. But what kind of, what kind of uh, performance requirements? It's going to have to be iterated, but what kind of performance are you thinking about in this system? Whatever the system may be, hydraulic system, thermal protection system, whatever. Then we talk about the three-legged stool, as Professor Hoffman said. We talk about uh, schedule cost, and I put weight under performance. Because as I told you before, the first thing you're going to wind up in, in, in designing a system, that the weight's going to get too high. Then you're going to find out that performance goes down. You have schedule slips. But first thing usually happens is you find out, you wake up one morning, and you find out, my gosh, my system weighs a lot more, my subsystem weighs a lot more than they told me I could have. So you ought to understand your weight. And then you need to think about what is the available technology. What's the technology available? As somebody pointed out, you pointed out, today the avionics technology is probably pretty high up on the ladder. And you could probably pick something today right off the shelf. Although, in my experience of the 30 years I had in the space program, I never was able to find something that was off the shelf. Uh, space programs just don't usually allow you to take something off the shelf. Uh, I've, I've told, people told me to go do it, and when I, once I went and did it, we changed everything. But today, in the technology we have in the avionics, you may be get, able to get a lot of off the shelf. So what technology is available? And then one of the key things, one of the big, biggest things you have to know are what are the interfaces? You could see the multitude of interfaces that are required for the guidance, navigation, and control system. It takes into consider all the interfaces you could think about. And so you need to think about interfaces, whether they be mechanical, whether they be electrical, whether they be functional. So you need to think about what interfaces are you talking about. And to me, that is some guidelines you need to think about. Of course, then we talk about, as we said, cost and schedule. Uh, usually your cost is going to grow, uh, unfortunately, and usually your schedule is going to slip. And those, what I would call, are career-limiting problems. That's the best way to get fired, is to have your cost go up and your schedule uh, increase. So um, these are some of my guidelines for things you ought to look for when you, do, when you try to design your system. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you all uh, that you may have. Yes, sir. Question that uh, you said about taking technology off the shelf, and I'm wondering, I don't think 
from what I know, it wasn't really thought of much during the shuttle, but the idea of uh, maybe putting something on the shelf, so to speak, the idea of, of designing something so that it would have a, a subsystem or something, so it would have the flexibility to be used in, in future systems, and where that, uh, do, you, do you see what I'm, where I'm No, I don't think I quite follow what you're saying. The, the, the yeah. idea of, well, you said there wasn't really um, off-the-shelf technology available then, but maybe there is now. So the, the idea I'm thinking about is the idea of designing something not so much just for the shuttle in this case, yeah. but so that it can be used, used for other things. Um, well, of course, that that's a, a very possible thing to do and be a very good thing to do. But uh, in my experience, and we've tried something like that, but usually this tends to start going into it. You start to saying, well, what is it really going to cost you to do that? Uh, I know pe when I was project manager, people would come to me with something like that. And uh, I was a pretty mean, I used to be a pretty mean guy. I'm not quite as mean as I uh, used to be. But, uh, but when they come, that's the first thing I'd ask them is what about the cost? Because that's what happens. When you start trying to make multiple uses out of something, you usually drive the cost up. And that's what you have to be careful of. It's, uh, y yes, sir. Can I give a story about this idea of putting something on the shelf? Sure. Oh, the Duffy building. There's a spacecraft hanging up in the lobby, and I'm not sure if it has the logo on it or not, but it's the answer I found out two years ago. I asked some wide jerk labs, got the prime contract for Apollo GMC three months after John Kennedy made a 61 announcement. Keep in mind, the 61 satellites were really, really crude. But uh, Dr. Aver, with his leadership and vision, decided several years prior to put my rad money into the following mission an autonomous, automatic, four-year mission to Mars, to when we had not really gotten the hang of launching the global orbit. He sent a satellite out that would not require any ground commands, star trackers, fly by Mars, take pictures, have people on glass plates, come back. This was a kind of a very far-reaching concept. He decided that to make it happen, he and Aver, they needed to have a very high throughput, very reliable <coughs> space radiation qualified computer. And that's what made it all ongoing money. As I said, if we don't have that, the mission just can't work. So they didn't build the spacecraft, they built the computer. When John Kennedy made this announcement, Draper Labs was a position to say, we have a key technology here, and that was the part of the Holocaust. Well, let me add to that. I, uh, I, I uh, feel very strongly that had it not been for the uh, MIT Instrumentation Lab or the Draper Labs and the people they had there, the technology they had there, we wouldn't have gone to the moon when we said we were going to do it. I really feel, I mean, I work very closely with them and I feel very strongly that the, the Draper Labs, I keep getting mixed up, at that time the MIT Instrumentation Lab was really the uh, one of the prime movers of the whole uh, system. It was really uh, fantastic. Uh, so the people working here and, and can take advantage of that, it's, uh, it'll be very useful for you to do that. Uh, any other questions? Well, I'll be, I won't be here, um, but I'll be back on the 22nd and uh, look forward to, to working with you some more. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hey, yeah. Sorry. Not as much to do with the subsystems, but back to the overall uh, concept of the shuttle. Um, I was wondering why, if you know at all, why the military thought it was important to have the ability to capture a satellite and bring it back. Was it because satellites were so expensive at the time? Maybe they aren't as much? Because I don't think we've really done that. Well, we did. Uh, it really wasn't the military. We did. To, uh, uh, several of the satellites we did bring back. Uh, I can't recall which ones were. Itelsat the and West Star and, Star and Palapa. Those were the ones I. And we did retrieve those. A little later. And we retrieved those because they were. And uh, it turns out, interestingly enough, they were insured by the um, by Lloyd's of London. And uh, that was the biggest salvage operation Lloyd's of London ever achieved when they returned those satellites. Bigger than anything in the ocean they ever picked up. In fact, they rang the bell. When they have a big recovery, a big thing in Lloyd's of London, they ring a bell. And uh, they came down to the uh, uh, Sir somebody, whoever he was, I don't recall who he was, but he was head of Lloyd's of London, came back and we had a big reception at the Johnson Space Center after we retrieved uh, West Star and Palapa. I don't think the Air Force really had uh, that much demand at the time, or it went away, whatever it was, for retrieval and uh, for uh, retrieving payloads. But what, commer commercials what, did. What the what the military was interested in, 
uh, was the possibility of refueling satellites in orbit. That's right. Yeah, we did do that. When, That's when right. When you yeah. have uh, right. reconnaissance satellites, uh, very often you have to change their orbit to get them over the right place at the right time. And orbital maneuvering fuel is a limiting commodity right. on satellites. And these are very expensive satellites to build. So if you have the possibility of refueling, um, then in principle you can extend the, the life of these very high value assets. And we we did we did do a, a, a demonstration of, you know, of course the fuel in most cases is hydrazine, which is very nasty stuff. If you get it on your spacesuit, you can't come inside until you bake it off. So and it, 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 it's, it's fairly dangerous. And um, the um, uh, so we, we actually did uh, do a demonstration just in the shuttle's cargo bay, but we've never actually uh, done a, a real refueling of a satellite in orbit. But they're still working on it now. Now there's, there's. Uh, I think the the military is still working on possibly uh, robotic refueling um, technologies. Uh, so for whatever the next version of the shuttle or crew vehicle would be, is it is it necessary or even really? Uh, Good idea to have this huge cargo. Well, I think that's what they're. I think that's what they're eliminating. I haven't been close to it, but yeah, the yeah. CEV is going to be really a, a passenger carrier, yeah. and then any cargo will be on a, a an unmanned vehicle, I believe. Yeah. So that that's what they're separating. Is a is that right? I mean, I, I haven't well, been really that close to yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, one, one uh, this is this is one of the guidelines now for for future space vehicles is to the maximum extent possible separate humans and cargo. If the original concept of the shuttle had been realizable, that the shuttle would be able, capable of flying frequently enough that it could basically satisfy all of our launch needs, then you can make the argument, well, all right, you know, we're, we're doing this and people are in it to fly it and, and, you know, we'll just do it that way. But given the fact that, that we, can't, we can't fulfill that, goal, uh, then you have to ask why put humans at risk to take just to take a satellite up in the cargo bay and, and launch it uh, when we can launch satellites using unmanned vehicles. Um, and in fact that was the decision after the Challenger accident was uh, any payloads that are carried into space on the shuttle in general, I mean, there were, there were some exceptions for various reasons, but you ought to be using the shuttle to do things where you need people to do them. And some of those things, for instance, the servicing of Hubble or uh, the assembly of the space station, al although even that could be argued that, that it, it had, had we planned it differently, we might have been able to do it without making such extensive use of the shuttle. But, but there we do make full use of the big cargo bay. But, but future human space vehicles, the CEV, uh, will be basically a people carrier with a small amount of cargo. And any time you want to launch large amounts of cargo, you'll, you'll do it without people. Let's take a uh, one, one or two minute break. I'm going to get my computer set up. Yep. And let me put this this down here. Um, I want to uh, give you a, a short presentation just to uh, bring everybody up to a certain level of familiarity with uh, with what the shuttle does and and what it looks like. Um, and again, I tend to look at this from an operational point of view. Um, this will be informal, you know, ask questions as, as we go through. Um, you know, as we've said, the, the two critical phases of shuttle operations uh, and what makes this such a unique vehicle is it launches vertically like a spaceship with a tremendous amount of, of power um, and it lands uh, you know, you look at this and, and, you know, you have to remind yourself that, uh, you know, it looks like an airplane landing. 
and yet a half an hour ago this was a spaceship going in orbit around the Earth. So it, it really uh, has been uh, a, a, a spectacular uh, technological achievement. Um, let's go through some of the, the maintenance operations, what is actually done to the shuttle. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but I think if you actually see some of the images, uh, it, it will help to, uh, to give some reality to some of this. So after the shuttle lands, here it's landing uh, on the, the runway at the Kennedy Space Center, and as we mentioned, all of this is a bird sanctuary, and so sometimes you have to chase the birds away, and uh, there's, there's a problem from time to time with crosswinds. Uh, there's only one runway, so if, if you get wind blowing across the runway at more than 15 knots, you can't land. And, and so that's also a constraint uh, sometimes to launch, because when you, uh, when you take off, you always have to be able to turn around and come back and land here, just like you have to be able to land over in Europe or Africa. Uh, and, uh, and so there are a lot of launch constraints. Um, what they do uh, is they, this is, was actually hooked up uh, back on the, on the runway, but they, they hook up air conditioning units. Uh, they, they have to purge. Uh, there's, a lot, there's an ammonia boiler. Remember we talked about getting rid of heat as you're coming in using water spray boilers. But uh, once you get below 100,000 feet, the pressure is actually above the triple point of water and you can't flash evaporate anymore and so they switch from a water boiler to an ammonia boiler and so after the shuttle lands there's ammonia fumes all over the place if you've looked at pictures of shuttle servicing on the runway sometimes if there isn't actually a wind blowing they big uh, bring around a big fan to to blow the ammonia away, and everybody has to stay upwind of the ammonia. And there's also the possibility, of course, that there may be a hydrazine leak, or you know, who who knows. Anyway, the orbiter has to be safe, and you have the people come out in in what looks like uh, um, spacesuits, escape suits. They call them self-contained. I don't, I don't remember the, the acronym, but in any case, uh, we're bringing the orbiter back to, uh, to the hangar area where it will undergo uh, a lot more than 14 days of servicing. I, I remember, you know, again, just to give you a sense of uh, the, the state of mind before we were actually operating the shuttle as, as a new astronaut back in 1978, and remember the shuttle didn't fly until 81, we were getting a series of lectures on all the shuttle systems, and I remember the lecture they gave us on turnaround, which was supposed to take 14 days, and, uh, and we got a briefing from the people who were planning the turnaround around and I remember they told us you know we've studied this really carefully and we just don't think it's going to be possible to turn the shuttle around in 14 days we've cut out every you know unnecessary step and we don't see we think it's impossible to do it in less than 16 days so I mean, you know that and that's kind of the way people were thinking you know we we were talking about um, you know it's supposed to make 60 flights a year uh, and you know people were skeptical you know there's no way they can make more than 40 flights a year I mean, you know it we just people just didn't didn't have a concept of how complex it was going to be to operate this this vehicle uh, because it is such a, a complex vehicle vehicle um, to operate it safely is difficult. Now sometimes it lands in um uh, in California, and in that case, you put it on the 747. This is the same uh, bipod fitting that just to essentially duplicate the way the, that the uh, orbiter is put on the um, on, on the external tank, um, and the the tail pod is, of course, for aerodynamics. And that was also the configuration uh, for the uh, for the approach and landing tests. And actually, later, and I think in the middle of October, Gordon Fullerton, who was uh, one of NASA's premier test pilots, he he still flies. I mean, he's still I, I I can't even I'll have to find out from how many different types of airplane he's flown. He's just an amazing guy. Uh, but he was actually in the uh, the shuttle during the, that 
first uh, approach and landing test. So he can he can tell us about what it was actually like test flying the shuttle, as well as being on uh, the third uh, orbital flight test. Yeah. Do they carry anything on the airplane when they're when they're taking inside here? Yeah. Uh, no, this is not not your opportunity for a transcontinental uh, <laughs> vacation trip. There there are a few a few. I mean, you know, there are a few people who ride along with it because you need the the maintenance people. They also have uh, an airplane flying about uh, 50 miles in front of this checking for turbulence uh, and in the early days they had a chase airplane as well. well that's that's when I told them people they were crazy trying to get me to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, so now a, l a look at some of the the details. Remember we took talk about how the engines are are taken out. Y you get a little bit of a view here inside the engine compartment. I, I had the chance on numerous occasions to actually go inside the engine compartment, and I mean it's just amazing. You get these these huge big pipes, and it's it it really helps when you're when you're going to be using a system like this. You know. We, we spend a lot of time in the simulators, and uh, you know you'll you'll flip a switch, and that switch controls the what they call the the uh, the main fuel uh, shutoff valve. It's a it's a big butterfly valve about 17 inches in diameter inside this huge pipe, and you know you sit in the simulator and you flick the switch, and the and the talk back you know shows that the thing is closed and then you you actually go in the compartment and and you look and there's this huge pipe and and this area in it and you realize you know this this huge thing that's moving around and and it kind of gives a sense of realism and in fact that's that's one of the uh, the big safety concerns you know when when the fuel is flowing the butterfly valve is is in a vertical position so the fuel flips by it it's obviously it's an unstable situation if it goes out just a little bit, then the fuel flow can slam it closed, and and you've got a explosion on your hands. So that 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 was a, a major consideration. This is the body flap, uh, so you can see all of the the plumbing and and all these red things are removed before flight uh, stickers. Um, it's uh, it's a very very complex uh, process. And they pull the engines out after every flight now and. Uh, uh, yep. Yep. And that's the thing. You know, all of all of the platforms have to be designed so that they, you know, they they fold up and they fold down so that you can get access to all all the places. I mean, it's a it's a very complex system. And this was built. A lot of the equipment, the launch platforms and everything, as we mentioned, were built were were adapted from uh, from the Apollo program. But the uh, the hangars, which we call the OPF, the Orbiter Processing Facility, was was built specifically for the the shuttle. The tiles we talked about, I mean, that's just a huge amount of, uh, of work uh, replacing, maintaining, uh, and testing the tiles. This is inside the, uh, the cargo bay. You know, you've got lots of, uh, you've got the fuel cells, you've got uh, hydrogen and oxygen cryogenic tanks, helium pressurization tanks, nitrogen for your atmospheric system. This is the bulkhead in front of which uh, uh, on one side you have the engine compartment, on the other side you have the, the crew compartment. And, uh, you know, like we mentioned, this, this has to be done essentially in clean room conditions and yet it's on the scale of a battleship so it's it's a real challenge um, this is the uh, the forward window on you know maybe one in every five flights will get a little ding on the windshield from uh, from a little piece of uh, usually orbital debris in fact more often than not it turns out to be little paint chips on one of my flights they whenever they do that they they remove the window they replace it and uh, and they do a chemical analysis to see whether it was a micrometeorite or or a piece of uh, space debris um, the windows are actually uh, there's three panes. There's a, a, a redundant uh, pressure pane. There's, there's the two panes on the inside uh, are capable of holding pressure, and the outer is a, a thermal pane. This is the one of the orbital maneuvering system pods. These are uh, removable. 
because again they contain nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine and we, we mentioned the fact that these are called hypergolic fuels when you when you bring them together they ignite spontaneously as opposed to hydrogen and oxygen you need a spark igniter uh, so they're, they're in, in that one sense that it's a nice system because when you want to use them in your reaction control and you only want to say you know a very tiny tenth of a second pulse you don't have to worry about an igniter which is a potential failure point you just squirt in the hydrazine and the nitrogen tetroxide and boom. but they're very nasty stuff they are they are extremely toxic and of course highly combustible and they are very corrosive so uh, these pods are serviced in a place far away from where the other activities take place for the orbiter so just in case there's a leak or an explosion it's not going to take down the rest of the critical facilities so this is the orbiter maneuvering engine um, and then they also have these smaller reaction control engines um, and there's two aft pods and and all the fuel tanks with the, the hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide are are in here um, the aft system the two pods they actually have uh, interconnects so that you can actually cross feed from one system to the other and all that stuff has to be hooked up the forward uh, system is independent you can't cross feed to that the landing gears we talked a little bit the other day about the tires you know these things sit up in space for two weeks at a time you've got to worry about thermal control uh, you've got a um, you know can you imagine if if you had a slow leak and you know you found out that your tire was flat before you uh, started your reentry so um, and then of course the problem of sealing th this against the hot gas um, you know the 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 tiles on the edge of the doors for the landing gear those are that's a very critical section um, anyway uh, after you typically about a three month turnaround in in the hangar uh, they they wheel the uh, orbiter actually uh, originally it, it was act pulled over on its on its own wheels and then they but that required that they then stow the wheels in in the bi this big vertical assembly building this is the vertical assembly building uh hopefully you've seen pictures i mean of it it's it's huge it was actually built to assemble the saturn rockets it's it's much taller than we need for the uh for the orbiter stack um but uh but it it has been adapted so what goes on here is it's it's wheeled into the uh, the big uh, vertical assembly uh, building in the meantime uh, there it is uh, actually on the on the inside you you just don't get a sense of the size of this building from any picture that, that can be taken you have to be there and and see it to to really appreciate it okay in the meantime uh, you remember the solid rocket boosters uh, are, are uh, recovered after every flight uh, and the the Liberty Star and I think the Freedom Star that's the NASA Navy uh, these these boats uh, are, are positioned out uh, 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 offshore and and they uh, they actually they have divers and they go down and they put in plugs and, and, and flotation devices so that they, they actually float the uh, the boosters and they drag them back where they're disassembled cleaned up uh, the actual uh, segments which contain the fuel are shipped back to Utah to Thiokol which is now ATK for cleaning ref refilling and and the other parts the nozzle and the and the top which contains which contains the electronics and the parachutes those are serviced in Florida um, and then they're brought in in uh, segments into the um, vehicle assembly building where they are stacked and remember those are the the segment sizes that uh, 
Some of these are assembled in the factory. Those are the so-called factory joints. And then where these are come, come together, that's the so-called field joint, and that's the joint that failed in the, in the Challenger accident. This is, gives you a sense of the size of those solid rocket motors and the way the, the solid fuel is, uh, is put in. And they do all of these tests to look for the roundness of the motor and the, the flatness of the, uh, of the, the propellant. Yeah? Is that the fuel itself? Uh, I think it's, yeah, I, it, it, it is, although what confuses me about this is I'm not sure which segment this is because most of the, the fuel is actually put in with a, with a star pattern in it to, to a, and, and they actually shape the way it's loaded so that you, you shape the thrust profile. Um, and, and I've not been able to get a good explanation of, of, of why that is not the case here. Um, in any case, this is now uh, the process where they they lift one segment, they put it down on top of another. Of course, all of these are hazardous activities. N nobody is allowed, except for the, the critical personnel. Nobody's allowed in the VAB when they're when they're doing this, just in in case there's a problem. And then they uh, they actually uh, put all of these bolts in to. Uh, to join up the, the field join and now of course after Challenger we have a new and improved O-ring configuration. Wow. Okay, so now we have the two solid rocket boosters uh, sitting on the uh, mobile launch platform and uh, again you can see they, you have to design all of these platforms so you have access and, and uh, it's um, now the external tank we talked about, this is in, in Michoud, this, this has actually been uh, damaged uh, not too heavily but it did suffer damage from Katrina. So this is the oxygen tank up front, notice how small this is compared to this is the big hydrogen tank and then this is actually the front side but there this is then turned around and, and the two are joined together inside the outer shell. Uh, and of course, the external tank is what the, the, the solids are joined to the external tank, the orbiter is joined to the external tank. So basically the external tank needs a strong back mechanism inside it because that's ultimately what's tying the whole stack together. And the thrust from the solids and the thrust from the main engines ultimately they, they're linked together through the external tank. So uh, the tanks themselves, the, the uh, hydrogen and oxygen tanks, don't have a lot of beefy structure but going through this is is a, a very heavy structure to, to the yeah. The diameter of the uh, hydrogen tank there is about the diameter of the overall structure. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That gives another idea of the scale. This is cleaning and polishing inside the the uh, the big hydrogen tank. Um, I mean, it's. Yeah, again, the, the scale of all of this is, is uh, it's important to get a, a sense of, of what's involved in, in taking care of these vehicles. So they can do that? People actually have to go in and screw it by hand? Uh, I guess. I mean, you, 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 because the scrubbing is only part of it. The inspection is the really critical thing to see if there's any, uh, you know, any anything that's that's not quite right. Comment. Sure. Uh, one thing that's interesting. Uh, the use of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, is uh, wanted so much because of its high performance. But on the other hand, if you would do something like uh, liquid oxygen in kerosene, you would get a much, uh, you would get a much uh, smaller tank or a similar propellant. And there is a trade-off, I think, today. People are realizing, especially from the Russians. The Russians don't really use liquid hydrogen. Uh, you get lower th uh, ISP, but your tanks become so much smaller to deal with. And uh, hydrogen's a very hard, uh, very hard to deal with. It's very hard to find a hydrogen base. And hydrogen's very hard to deal with. My second flight. You remember that was the <laughs> that was the one with the hydrogen leaks. Remember that we we went down. We were supposed to launch in May of 1990, and we went down. And when they when they they before they they fill the system, uh, they they do a helium leak check. And of course, helium for those of you who have worked with vacuum system, helium will leak through anything. And if the system is tight against helium, they figure it will be it will be it, it's 
t the problem is that that's done at ambient temperature and when you fill it with the cryogenic hydrogen uh, everything contracts and so things which were vacuum tight uh, at ambient temperature are are not always vacuum tight and in fact but the problem is you don't know that until you fill it which is only done you know a few hours before launch so you know we had we had gone down to the Cape we were in, in medical quarantine and you know we just got the message about six hours before launch there's a hydrogen leak launch is scrubbed uh, they they did some checks you know they uh, they drained the tank they did another helium leak check it was fine we had gone back to Houston we came back same thing happened um, well, in the end, we made six trips over the course of six months, and we didn't launch until December. And and actually, another one of the shuttles also had a hydrogen leak. When they 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 actually alternated us, they they pulled us off the launch pad. They put somebody else on. Uh, I mean, it was just a, what what had happened was they had somewhat changed the procedure of installing some O-rings in the in in these big hydrogen lines, and it required a process where the workers were actually working in an area where, where they couldn't see and the and the the o-rings were, were being installed slightly wrong and, and that, but it was just terribly difficult to uh, to track that down uh, so yeah there's there's a lot of problems using uh, cryogenic fuel now the other thing is um, if you have a fully staged vehicle with a separate first and second stage one of the things that 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 you learn in in you know rocket propulsion classes is is that uh, in the first stage the the specific impulse is not nearly as important what's really important is to get a lot of thrust in your upper stages having a high ISP becomes much more important in terms of the payload that you can carry so if you had a fully staged vehicle and that was the in fact that's the way Saturn worked the the first stage of Saturn was kerosene and liquid oxygen and the upper stages were cryogenic with hydrogen and oxygen just for that reason okay let's move on so now we have the the external tank uh, again suspended in the uh, vertical assembly building that's lifted up and joined uh, between the two SRBs this is the feed line where the oxygen comes down and uh, the, uh, this is where the these two are the uh, feed lines this is the hydrogen and then the orbiter has has two corresponding uh, feed ports where the hydrogen and oxygen comes into the uh, engine and actually when you fill the tank on the pad you actually put the hydrogen and oxygen into the orbiter and it flows from the orbiter back then into the external tank and it was on this oxygen fitting from the foam that they put around this was what fell off in the uh, in the recent discussion Discovery flight that they, where they did get a big piece of foam. Okay, so now we go back. Remember, we brought the orbiter over into the vertical assembly building. Now you put this strong back uh, to hold the orbiter, and this is really spectacular. I mean, you, you lift the whole orbiter up off the ground and you, you tilt it up, and then you, you basically hang it and lower it. And you know, it's it's uh, this is this is um, you know these are big pieces of equipment, and yet you know it's it you you need um, millimeters of, of accuracy. So you know, very skilled crane operators to say to say the least. Uh, okay, so now we we have the orbiter and the strong back is is laid down in position, and and all of the uh, the mating is done. Uh, and we're on the pad, uh, excuse me, we're on the mobile uh, launch platform and they put the, the crawler transporter underneath it and then they, they roll it on these uh, specially prepared paths which have very, uh, you know, I don't know how deep it goes into the ground, but this is heavy river gravel. Most of the boulders are about the size of your fist, but after one or two uh, trips of the orbiter, it's crushed down to the size of pea gravel, and then they have to replace it with new, with new stuff. And of course, as you're going out to the pad, when you're rolling up to the launch pad, you're actually going up at an angle, and so this whole system you can see the crawlers down here. Each one of these treads 
each each single piece of the tread weighs a ton. I mean, just to give you a, a sense of, it goes about one or two miles an hour top speed. It, it takes hours to get out there, and and the whole it has to be capable of staying level to within a few degrees, even as you're climbing the ramp up to the the launch platform. So what's supporting? Just what are those things supporting the? the these are, uh, the, the whole stack is basically sitting on the two SRBs. The, the skirts of the SRBs is, is taking the weight. These are the fuel inputs which are connected through the other side where the, the, um, the hydrogen and the oxygen run into the shuttle and from there, in the way I showed you before, it goes into the external tank. They also keep it. Uh, Does it have a tendency to, I mean... The, on each, each of the SRBs has four bolts. I'll, I'll actually, I'll bring in, I, I have, they, they give us as a souvenir after our, a flight, they give, they give us the, the big nuts that, that are explosive, explosive bolts. So there's, there's eight, four on each of the SRBs, and, and that's, that's essentially, that, that, that's what gives it its stability. Okay, so you know, again, we have to. This is a this is a hill. It's a little hard to see the perspective, but but keeping the whole thing steady. And we talked about how you can see this track here, where the payload changeout room eventually can come around and, and cover the the shuttle to give it protection. Another, yeah, this is this is actually going up uh, the hill to get up. That's just a pretty picture that I like. And here we are. This, this is nice because you have both shuttles on the launch pad. Uh, these are, this is a big water tower. Uh, in order to protect the launch pad against flame damage and also to protect the shuttle against uh, acoustic effects, they, they actually get a shock wave when you ignite the engines which can bounce back uh, and and do some damage so they they uh, shortly about 15 seconds before uh, T0 they start they open up the valves and all that water flows with little jets coming if you've seen pictures of, of launch sometimes they show that as part of the launch sequence in fact I'll in another class I'll, I'll show you some of the details of, of of an actual launch picture so that's the water deluge and that goes for about 30 seconds and that that cushions the acoustic load uh, reflected back to the shuttle okay that's enough pictures on the pad oh I know what I wanted to show um, this is called the white room and that's how the crew goes in. You take an elevator up to here, and then that actually joins up with the with the hatch. So the hatch is sitting open, and uh, you you put on your parachutes and the, the last uh, few pieces of equipment to get in. And this is this is a view inside the white room. This is I guess from our last flight in 1996. So. Uh, and when you go out on launch day, the big thing that you notice that's different is there's very few people on the pad, only the essential personnel, and the whole stack is creaking because it's now filled with the cryogens and everything is shrunk and, and it's sort of, it's alive uh, in, in a very strange way. So we talked about the, uh, the mission profile, I won't, I won't deal with this. And, um, I think I'll. I, I do want to turn, talk about some of the the shuttle aborts, but we'll do that an, another time because I, I want to get finished with the with the slides. Um, I did want to show you after Challenger they they introduced a, a bailout. We, you know, we did mention that that uh, you. I mean, the basic survivability for the crew requires an intact orbiter. It used to be that it needed an intact orbiter landing on the ground or ditching in the ocean, which was kind of an unlikely survivability because you're going to hit the ocean at 200 knots and probably break up. So, so now there are circumstances where you can, you can lose more than one engine during launch or you might have to do an emergency deorbit where you basically uh, can be flying along at 4,000, 40,000 feet stably but with no place to land. And so that's that's the really the only situation which the bailout system protects you against. But there is a there's a collapsible pole. Uh, the reason for that is 
because the aerodynamic studies show that if you just jumped out of the the open hatch with a parachute, you, the the, um, the the airflow would carry you back on top of the wing, and you'd hit the Ohm's pod, and and that would probably that would not be a good deal. So you actually hook yourself to to this uh, uh, escape pole, and that takes you down below the wing, and and then you can open your parachute. That's a uh, and, and we actually practice this where you go out into a swimming pool uh, using the escape pole. That's, these are some actual tests conducted by Army parachutists um, in a, I think it was a 141 transport. So the system has been tested in flight, although never with a shuttle. And that's the, the test where they have us do this, you know, they have a simulated hatch and you, you basically jump out into, a, uh, into the swimming pool. So once again, into the uh, into the white room, you can see the, the hatch out here, and that's the last thing that they'll do is they they close the hatch, then they pressurize the shuttle by about one and a half psi just to make sure that it has pressure integrity before launch, and then we uh, then we launch. Um, you know, as you can see, you're burning hydrogen and oxygen in the main engines. Uh, so what's coming out there is just hot steam, not very visible. Most of the, the smoke and the noise and everything comes from the, the solid rocket boosters. However, uh, you do need uh, these engines. In fact, the people have calculated that if you tried to take off without these main engines, pushing up on the shuttle that, that the attachment between the shuttle and the external tank would probably fail. Um, each of the main engines is about, well, it's a half a million pounds of thrust in vacuum. It's, it's slightly under 400,000 pounds at sea level. So you've got, you know, a little over a million pounds coming from the main engines, but these are, these are putting out, uh, you know, almost three million pounds apiece. So most of your, your early thrust in the first two minutes are coming from the uh, solid rocket boosters. And it's a pretty rough ride. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of vibration. Uh, when you go through Mach 1, which is max Q, uh, maximum dynamic pressure, the vibrations are even, uh, even more pronounced. In fact, the first time on my first flight, I, I really thought the wings were going to come off. There was so much vibration, but of course they, they don't. But I, I, I'd love to get a hold of it. I, I actually saw a, a high speed, a slow, mo well, a slow motion picture actually looking at the tail as you go through max Q and you can actually see the tail fluttering back and forth like that. I mean the, the loads, the aerodynamic loads on, on the vehicle during ascent are significant and, and you do actually have to uh, move your, el your elevons to, it's called load relief uh, in order to, to take a, a stress off, off that. So <clears throat> this you know, I, I, I really like this. It, it gives a sense of the, the power that you're sitting on top of to, to get up there. Uh, and that's just a nice, nice picture of riding the fire. Um, okay, so you get up in orbit, you drop the external tank, um, and although now they're, they're going out of their way to, to take uh, even uh, better close-ups of the tank to look at the foam shedding, we've been doing that, uh, in fact, throughout uh, the, the history. Now they, they specially time the launch so that you're guaranteed to drop the external tank with good lighting conditions. That didn't used to be a constraint to launch, but it is now. You can also, by the way, see how the atmosphere quickly fades out into space. And that's a telephoto, the, so it, it actually makes the atmosphere look even thicker than it, than it really looks when you're... Okay, so there's, uh, there's the orbiter uh, in space. That was uh, actually after it had delivered a, a payload. This was taken from, a, from the space station. Um, and just a quick reminder of all the different things that we've we've used the the orbiter for uh, launching satellites. You've seen that picture. These uh, this is a payload assist module to take the satellite from the shuttle orbit up to geosynchronous transfer orbit. Um, we have used it extensively for satellite uh, repair in orbit. Uh, this is the, the Intelsat where uh, it was put into orbit by an expendable rocket but into a bad orbit uh, because of underperformance and, and uh, 
they managed to get it into a shuttle compatible orbit and I won't go through the whole history that you know why there happened to be three people out there is a, a whole story in itself uh, this is one of the satellites that we actually again the satellites were put into orbit uh, by the shuttle uh, but the, and the shuttle deployment was fine but the payload assist module which you saw before did not perform properly and so the two satellites were stranded in a useless orbit we went back and, and we actually brought them back to the ground they were refurbished and relaunched again on expendable rockets um, the shuttle was, it has also been used as a space station with the space lab on the inside. So, you know, to do carry out scientific experiments. This is a large pressurized module which is put into the cargo bay, uh, and the original idea. Uh, as Professor Cohn mentioned, was you you know you you could just take your laboratory equipment off the shelf, plug it in here, uh, 120 volts AC power, I guess, and and it would be just like working on the ground. Well, it never was, but. Having said that, I think the Space Lab program as a whole was was extremely successful. Um, and then it's been used to service uh, the Mir space station. We certainly added several years of useful life to the Mir station because we could carry up a lot more equipment than the Russians could themselves, and uh, that was uh, also gave us an opportunity to to get some U.S. astronauts on long duration space missions. Uh, and then, as, as you all know, we're using the shuttle to, uh, to construct the International Space Station. Um, and hopefully we'll get more of it built before too long. Uh, it, the shuttle is also an excellent platform performing, for performing EVAs, spacewalks. Um, you know, and, and that's a picture of when we went up and, and repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you know, the, I, I can't overestimate the, the capability that, that the shuttle gives us as a work platform in orbit. Um, we can do this sort of complex EVA activity on the space station, but once we retire the shuttle, uh, we've, we've essentially lost that capability. You know, to have the manipulator arm as a, and, and to be able to use people and the robotic arm to move equipment around. Uh, it's just a very powerful uh, work platform. That's one of my favorite pictures, just floating up there. Well, Guy is an expert on space. He's also responsible for space and defense. I'm going to ask him some questions. So this is a, a pretty picture of uh, firing the orbiter maneuver and maneuvering engines just to start your descent into the atmosphere. You know, despite the fact that you're going at uh, 18,000 miles an hour, you only have to slow down by a few hundred feet per second in order to lower your perigee down to the essentially the surface of the Earth, so that half an orbit later you intersect with the atmosphere, and uh, of course that produces the aerodynamic heating, which you can see on the the outside. This is looking out to the front. That's kind of a a, a dull glow. You know, it starts out as a as a deep red, and then it gets orange and yellow, and finally white on the outside. The most spectacular thing, uh, you know, you're you're a meteor. So this is a picture that was taken from Houston. Uh, looking at a, this is at about 250,000 feet at about Mach 12 on the way to a landing at the Kennedy Space Center. And on the inside, if if you actually shuttle is flying like this, so if you look up the overhead windows, you can actually look back into the wake. And this is this is really spectacular because you have these uh, different colors. It's sort of shimmering around. And every once in a while, when I would be looking at this, you'd see a big bright light going, you know. And, and I would think, boy, I hope that was nothing important. It was probably, <laughs> what, what people said it probably was, was little bits of gap fillers. You, you may have heard that on, on the last flight, they discovered that some gap fillers were protruding. And so Steve Robinson uh, went around and actually pulled some of them out. But they've probably been doing that the whole time. And they just come off. And, and, it, and it's really this, this little point where you have the convergence of the, of the shock waves, uh, this is about uh, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's that's the surface temperature of the sun. It's uh, it's a spectacular visual uh, view, and and then uh, again at this point we're just going subsonic, flying like a uh, like a glider, and uh, and ready for touchdown. 
So I hope that that, uh, that gives you some sense of, you know, visually uh, what goes on in the course of a, of a shuttle flight uh, with an emphasis on, on the maintenance operations, uh, you know, without appreciating how complex it is to operate this system, um, you know, I, I think it's hard to to really make the link between the original concept and the difficulties we've had in getting the shuttle to perform uh, in terms of the, the turnaround and maintainability. So again, just wrapping up, um, that's my kind of farewell picture, but um, the, the shuttle uh, it, it was an amazingly ambitious concept and I think what, what has been uh, astounding is, is how well the shuttle has been able to perform and do all the things that, that it was designed to do in terms of the satellite launching and being used as a science platform, performing EVA, repairing satellites, building space stations. Uh, you know, it's given us experience and capability to learn how to do things in Earth orbit, which, which we never had before. And as I say, we may well miss them once we retire the shuttle. But, uh, where we really did get it wrong, and, and this will be one of the things that we'll, we'll look at when we deal with the individual subsystems, is in the operations. It turned, to be a, it turned out to be a lot more complex, expensive, and delicate to operate than had been anticipated. And uh, so hopefully uh, there will come a time when, uh, when we set out to design another reusable vehicle, uh, possibly a reusable winged vehicle, and I think a lot of what we've learned from the shuttle will be uh, folded into that. It still is a question of how reusable the, the next crew exploration vehicle, the CEV, will be. Reusability has been put in as a requirement Requirement, but that remains to be seen of, and, and certainly the experience that we've got from, gotten from the shuttle is going to make people look really, really closely at what assumptions we're making about the reusability whenever we do this again. Okay, uh, next Tuesday will be the last in kind of the the conceptual uh, part of, of what we're doing. Uh, Professor John Logsdon from George Washington University uh, is a very well-known space policy analyst. He did uh, a, a seminal study on the Apollo program and has also written a lot uh, and done a lot of research on the origins of the shuttle um, and so he'll talk to us then. So let's see, I had probably promised to post everybody's emails on the web and I got diverted and didn't get that done but I but I will do that before tomorrow so you, you know in terms of forming your your teams uh, put together uh, an idea of, of what system you would like to work at if 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 you're not able to form up as part of the team between now and Tuesday, just give me what your own personal preference is, and then we can look at it and see if you know if different people are interested in the same system. You know, we'll let you all know and and, and help you form up teams. Can you post my email too, so in case the yes, yeah, I think your email is is there. I'll, I'll make sure that it's in there in the student view. Okay, yeah. Uh, the for next week, the paragraph and the preferences. Yeah, I just want to know what... As a group or turn in individually? Well, I mean, if you've already formed a group, then just turn turn in something as a group. That's fine. If not, if you haven't hooked up with somebody, just, uh, you know, let, let us know what what system you're interested in working at and, and any ideas you might have of, of what you're going to look at. You know, really, this, this is just a very, very short yeah. write-up. Essentially, to get you started, okay, and uh, and if you that way, if you have any questions, we can talk about it next Tuesday. Do you know any more specifics about what the final?